Starfleet and the United Federation of Planets create a lot of innovative technologies that are deployed to their member worlds. Many professions have such intricate devices added to their toolkits, and today we're looking at one of the most prolific medical tools, the hyperspray. So this little device's singular purpose was to administer chemicals into the body like a syringe, and it's found in both sick bays and as part of your standard med kit. Every cadet will learn how to use these to both administer and take samples. The first hypersprays on Starfleet vessels date back as far as the pre-Federation Starfleet of the 2150s coming across to Earth with the interspecies medical exchange, but humanity has been familiar with the technology behind these devices for centuries before that. In essence, the device uses high pressure to spray particles through the skin of a person and into the body. Such delivery allows for the more sterile application of medicine, as there is no injection needle, reducing contamination and allowing for the same hyperspray to be used on multiple people without transferring blood-borne illnesses or different species incompatibilities. Recorded accidents with grease guns date back to the 19th century, giving discovery of this new delivery system. In 1866, Dr. Jean Sale Giron invented the first example of what could be termed a nebulizer, where medicine was reduced to smaller particulates for inhalation. But it wasn't until 1935 that Arnold Sutermeister and Dr. John Roberts created something more akin to the hyperspray. A few years later, 1947, and the first hyperspray was created and underwent much testing and usage for inoculations and treatments among large populaces such as the military. As time went on, however, the device was revealed to have its own set of problems and not completely contamination free. The wound left was also longer lasting than that of a needle and apparently rather more painful depending on the model. The idea, however, is sound and has seen numerous adaptations and advancements with greater technological breakthroughs. There now exist several different varieties of needle-free injectors, and it's one of many sci-fi technologies rapidly becoming more feasible. Back to Trek now, and by the 2150s, the issues outlined above seem to have been all addressed. The Earth hyperspray was a grey box with a nozzle and a slot for fitting the chemical cylinder. The device would receive a chemical and then fire the spray through the pores of the skin when the trigger was pressed. This was powerful enough to even pass through several layers of clothing, such as the early Starfleet uniforms. Most common spray sites include the upper arm and the neck. I expect the neck was used as it was home to prominent arteries, a far more rapid delivery of whatever drug was prescribed. They could also be used to take samples. Somehow. By the next century, the hyperspray had evolved into a longer, narrower device, replacing the bulkier versions in use a decade before. But they functioned in much the same way, again still able to pass its contents through clothing. The only real improvement was in capacity, as a single spray could dose up to 10 people. By the 2350s and onwards, the device had shrunken in size once again, but could hold larger quantities of serums. They still functioned in basically the same way, with a slot and a vial, and a nozzle to administer the liquids. The latest one we see is from 2399 and is roughly the same size, but angled to make neck delivery easier? Maybe? Of course, the med bay in which it was synthesised was full of out-of-date equipment anyway, so it could have been older still. Hypersprays were used to administer many different compounds and medicines, for various functions inoculations against hazards, vaccinations against disease, and of course treatment for illness or pain. Many of these compounds that could be delivered are based on real-life medicines or the body's own naturally occurring chemicals such as adrenaline, but many are fictional, and from what I can tell, the different real medicines suffixes actually are a descriptor of their function, whereas some of these made-up ones are just that, made up to sound medical-ish. Maybe any watching blue shirts can confirm, but I couldn't spot a trend. Impedrazine was used to aid in cardiovascular functions, as was metrazine. Quadrazine was a powerful stimulant originally designed to restore neural activity on emerging from cryostasis. It was since adopted and adapted for other uses. 
Other stimulants include inaproveline, or the appropriately named hyperzine. Opposite this, we have sedatives of various potencies to be used in various situations. For example, one patient or species may be allergic to a certain chemical, so another is used, or perhaps it would mix with another medication. Ambazine, anethrazine, axonol, melazorine, neurazine, and tetrovaline, to name a few. Improvaline was another mild sedative, not to be confused with inaproveline, the potent stimulant. There were also analgesics or painkillers such as acinolithin, atroapan, and hydrocortoline. Some were generalised and some targeted certain types of pain such as muscle cramp or headaches. Erythrazine was a powerful anti-radiation compound used to treat major radiation poisoning. Netrazine was a milder alternative, and there are numerous unnamed inoculations that's actually granted temporary immunity to various radiations. Other compounds were even more specialised, such as triox, a high oxygenating compound added to the bloodstream to compensate for low oxygen environments until it wore off. Experimental compounds included such medicines as Vasakin, which drastically improved blood flow but in 22% of cases caused organ failure in most humanoids. There is a great variety in these chemicals and many that I've not mentioned, which makes sense as not only are they for different purposes, but they're created by numerous species from many different planets, each with their own unique quirks of biology. However, the humble hyperspray has not received the same diversification. Basically, the hyperspray's design has not really changed since its flaws were ironed out. The delivery system may have gotten smaller, but this is countered by other factors. Chiefly, it needs to remain ergonomic. Making technology smaller is all well and good, but there comes a point when there is no point. The device still needs to fit into humanoid hands and be large enough not to fumble its usage. So I think, as far as hypersprays are involved, the technology has kind of peaked. Future variations might simply move away from such delivery altogether. I mean, transporters are a thing and they already have a decontamination function that removes any foreign microbes from the data stream of a person mid-transport and then reassembles them without any harmful pathogens. So perhaps this would be another method of inoculations. For example, say you need to beam down to an irradiated planet, just load a serum into the transporter buffer and then beam down. So no need to visit a sick bay, first as it just adds the anti-radiation protection to your reassembly pattern. Anyway, that's just speculation for another time. Thanks for watching this short video on what we know on the evolution of the hyperspray, and I hope it was informative. I've been Rick and I'll see you again next time for another video. Thanks again. And goodbye.